These things are going to be powered by an autonomous AI system. It's already in place. And when it's there, it'll outthink, it'll think, it'll learn from the enemy's mistakes and from their successes. And it will compound that double down. And it has no fear of dying. Now, this, I want to get out of the patents and exotic propulsion systems, and I want to talk about something else. I stumbled upon this book, forward by Chuck Yeager, written by Dale Reed, published in 2002. And what caught my eye was wingless flight. I was actually looking for evidence, research, theories of orbed flight right? Or can I, you know, like, can it, could a tic-tac fly? Those kinds of things. I wanted to see that. I wanted evidence of that. And I wanted to see if I could find any kind of research that dealt with any kind of propulsion system that might allow that to happen. So this book, Wingless Flight, The Lifting Body Story. What's important for you to notice about this, as I scroll through this, is this book is written about work done in California at Edwards Air Force Base out in the desert where Chuck Yeager broke the Mach 1 barrier and where Poncho's, you know, hangout, which was the bar place where they all were, which is now burned down, where all of that was out at Edwards starting roughly in 1958 assembling the lifting body team. They brought in test pilots and what they were trying to find out if they could do was remove wings and flight control surfaces from a craft that could be towed could be a towed array could be taken up to an altitude and discharge let go and could it maneuver itself back down could it be launched in space and still maneuver itself back down? Could we actually power this kind of a thing and do this? And I was absolutely fascinated. I knew that the Air Force was probably looking at stuff like this, but I had no evidence of it. I just kind of had it in the back of my mind that as the space war was progressing, that, you know, in 58, 59, they were going to start getting pretty ballsy and start looking for could we actually come up with something and fly something like this now that tic tac thing is a model that people can buy so that's just why that's there i'm just looking at it and that image that's right there to me doesn't look like a tic tac in the gun camera image but doesn't matter it was what i found when i asked for tic tacs so here's a guy that was part of this this is dale reed who wrote the book and this is in 1959, 1960, 1961, this kind of research starts. And he's holding a model in his hand. And the model, the, the manifestation of that craft, the M2, is behind him. But what I want to draw your attention to are these sketches over here. This is 1963-66, the M2 F1 made 77 flights. Look at the shape of it. Very the much switch. what we showed last segment, right? And if they were building it and flying it, 77 flights in that particular one, 77 successful flights. Where do you think they are now? Yeah? You're way ahead. Way ahead. And the whole idea of wingless flight in lifting body story is that the body of the craft itself creates the lift. And the wings are only there either as verticals or diagonals. They are only there for one thing. And that's just because at that particular point in time, they needed a flight control surface. You know, you've got of the axes of flight, you have to have some way that you can pitch, yaw, and roll, right? And 
that comes from only those surfaces. But there have been discussions now of being able, and I will show you some photos, of being able to pull those lifting surfaces in flush with the skin of the craft. And then they only come up out of the skin of the craft when they need to, to affect some aerodynamic, you know, dragger on, on one side or the other to cause it to be steerable. But those sketches were done in 59. They became real aircraft in 1963 and were flown 63, 66. Next line down 66 to 67, 68, 73, 70, 75. And those craft, those, you will now see those craft. And that's why I'm going back to this whole gray black thing. If they were working on those shapes in the 60s, and now you're seeing something that pops out into Popular Mechanics or Defense Weekly that shows a shape identical to or similar to that, it's disinformation. It, it's not the real thing because they wouldn't have come that far forward at this point. We're talking 60, 70 some odd years and not have done something to move forward on that. I mean, these guys didn't run into a brick wall. What these guys did was they built the racetrack and the mind think and the mathematical voodoo to start to make this happen. And they also had the courage to fly them. Okay, here's some more just for out of interest to take a look at them. There you go. There's that one. Now, if you saw that coming out of the sky in 1961, what do you think you'd think? To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email through a glass darkly ads at gmail.com. UFO? Yeah, no kidding, right? Certainly wouldn't go, look, it's an airplane that has no wings. Same as that one. These are just showing the different test pilots, Bill Dana, etc. Lieutenant Colonel Michael Love. If you saw that in 1962, 63, it did not look what, like what we were flying then. But it has no wings on it. There you go again. Now, this next slide just sent, put the hair up on the back of my neck. These are the hardest concepts. <laughs> These are the hardest concepts for a lifting body flight, lifting body craft from 60, 61, 63, etc. When it says Langley lenticular bodies, is that the same Langley as in Langley, Virginia, CIA? I don't think so. I think the Langley lenticular body refers to the designer himself, Langley, and I don't know what his full name was. But the lenticular body, again, is it's a lifting body. And those little bumps sticking up on them were just as radical as they could get in that day for a control surface to make this thing pitch and roll, right? To go up and down. Now they can, act, as I said to you, those can be removed. And now it's a smooth body. And the only thing that comes up is a panel that comes up rapidly and then comes back down into it again. So if you capture a snapshot or a picture of it, when a control surface is up, then it looks different than when it's just in its streamlined lifting body fall or powered flight. So this is one of them is being towed by a DC-3. <laughs> it's being towed by a DC-3 up into the air and then it's released. And then the test pilots in there are flying this thing, testing a lifting body. You can see how flat it is on the top. That is a lifting body. The craft itself becomes a lifting body. And again, as I said to you, in just an aerodynamic flight, it doesn't take a lot. If you have the ability to create enough lift, only a small amount over the, the drag through the air, then the, the plane will fly. Yeah. I'm not an aerospace engineer, but I, I know that much about it. 
I don't know exactly what the ratios have to be based on the weight of the craft, et cetera. All of that's factored in by these guys. And that's why I said, I used the term a little bit ago, voodoo math. And voodoo math was the term they were using to the engineers about the engineers that were designing and telling these test pilots, like, it'll fly, you know? Yeah. And the test pilots are like, yeah, it's all voodoo math to me. You know, I don't think it, the numbers really pan out, but they did. Uh, there it is, and one of them in relation to the fighter at the time, F-104 chase plane. More schematics showing the M-2, the F-1, M-2, F-2, the F-3. Again, these were done in the 1960s. And you're seeing, you know, printed artist concepts and actual aircraft flying that look like this now. This is Edwards Air Force Base and again, and this is that the HL-10, which is rolling in and going to no wings and going to land there. This is an interesting... It looks like a Viking helmet. It, it does. It also looks almost identical to what I showed you in the last segment. But... In this artist concept, I mean, not, it's actually a photograph, but in this, they're trying to say that what they're creating in the design of the craft is it's like a badminton bird, right? That's how it's flying. It actually, it's flying. It's flying through the air, creating lift for itself. But if you're looking at the image on the left, those panels that I was telling you that flip up, right? Those are what are being flipped up to change the pitch of the aircraft now and to give it its yaw and roll and that, but to give it its roll, that's coming from still these vertical stabilizers. But now newer ones have those panels in the back all the way around where there are panels that pop up for pitch, right? And there are panels they can change like ailerons on wings so that they can cause it to roll, etc. And yaw, so they can cause it to move, push the nose from left to right for a coordinated turn. But it wasn't fully developed there. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. And I don't think anybody realized that we were working on these things back in the 60s. This was an effort to try to get to hypersonic flight in the 1960s. The canvas wings down at the bottom, they're, they're called right there, they're called the flexible Princeton sail wing, but they never used them. But they would have put them on over the hard, the rigid wing, which you see well behind the nose cone. And also the rigid wing folds back so that you have the lifting body of the craft itself. Anyway, a fascinating creature there that they were building to try to get the hypersonic flight. There it is in relation to the other ones and some models that are next to it. Supposedly remote control. Here's another interesting one. And now when you're looking at that, it sort of comes to your mind about where we are in lifting body flight and where going from SR-71s, you know, the SR-72s to go into the, the SR-99s and the SR-100, which everybody's speculating is there. 
Because that bomber that you see in the upper right-hand corner, which if you saw that coming across the sky, would be baffled by. But what it is, is another one of these things that it's a lifting body. The whole, every aspect of that craft lifts for itself. And it just has small control surfaces. And on the back, because one of the findings, if you remember back to like the second slide, we were talking about characteristics of some of the UAPs is that there's no visible thermal trace. There's nothing that we can see thermally or it's not observed. Well, that's kind of a key word, not observed. It doesn't mean that it's not still there. Yeah, I mean, we're working on every kind of a drive we could possibly imagine. I mean, look at the patents we looked at. And that was just a, a very tip of the iceberg. But the idea that you can't see it on some of these stealth fighters or stealth bombers or stealth reconnaissance aircraft, that doesn't disqualify it for being one of these UAPs or a UFO that we're seeing because it's freaking designed so that you can't see that. It dissipates it in such a way it doesn't show up. It doesn't show up on enemy cameras or IR or other things that thermal cameras. It doesn't show up because it wants to hide and they create it like that. I can't honestly tell you how successful that is, but I know that that is their goal. That's their objective. And there's probably a lot of other stuff going on there with electromagnetics and other things that they're using to disguise or make some sort of a thermal imprint go away. So to say it's not observed, that's a fair statement. To assume that because it's not observed that it's now powered by anti-gravity, that's probably not a fair assumption. Okay, so these are 21st century craft that you're looking at now. I showed you some of these, you know, in segment two. These are lifting body craft. And because there are photographs here, these are gray projects now. These are not secret classified programs. It would it be safe for us to assume that Venture Star here in the X-33, that it would be, you know, totally a lifting body surface controlled only by the panels and other things that I've discussed and read about? Yeah, I would say that the black projects of this have probably reached that point. Look at some of the other craft that have been created in the generations of craft since that time. Now, Aurora, interesting concept about Aurora. Aurora, everybody wants to pin to a particular kind of aircraft, and it wasn't. The director of the Black Budgets admitted on camera, and I saw him do it, admitted on camera that no, Aurora was an ISR program. And what I did was I, I just put everything under Aurora. I put it there because I thought that I could hide a lot of money in there for a lot of ISR aircraft development. And so that everything that kind of came out of that program, everybody thought, well, oh, that's an Aurora or that's an Aurora or that one's an Aurora. No, they came out of that budget umbrella. The guy tossed it in there because he's not trying to hide money, but he's trying to put money in there for the development of ISR, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. He's trying to put money in there because they don't want budget watchers or other people who are not cleared for that kind of information to start looking at something and turning around going, why are you spending this much money for this plane, right? So they have an umbrella, and this one was called Aurora, Project Aurora, and Project Aurora put a whole crap load of, of aircraft underneath it. Left, you see, that is the SR-91 reconnaissance aircraft, and the one on the right is that flying black wedge that is the 100. And it's questionable whether or not the 100 exists. Here you go again, Dale Reed with this X-38 technology. Again, this is a great program or you wouldn't be seeing it like that. This is another lifting body craft. See any control surfaces on this craft? 
No. No control surfaces that you can see on those craft, but there are control surfaces. They flip up off the body when the pilot makes a move. The one on the right is unmanned and the one on the left is going to be unmanned. It's a fighter, but it's a fighter. And both of them are going to be unmanned. Why? Because the fighter can pull more G's than a human can. And the fighter can stay aloft longer than a human can stay aloft and safely pilot it. And these things are going to be powered by an autonomous AI system. It's already in place. And when it's there, it'll outthink, it'll think, it'll learn from the enemy's mistakes and from their successes. And it will compound that double down. And it has no fear of dying. That's what you have to remember. That's why they're going to put that in these things. Because there's no decision that that system will make that is based on emotion or mm -hmm. a fear of harm. And it will make them extraordinarily deadly. It's concerning. You know, here's an artist concept. This one doesn't exist. It's they're just showing this here as a lifting body aircraft. Again, wings are getting shorter, narrower. And this is a refueler to refuel those jets in flight. The Army? says air force it, i don't know why the, it was on army tv is where i snagged it uh, okay. <laughs> but it's air force this is why the air force got the space program taken away from them because they're buying all this crap right so here again is that fighter the fact you're seeing it in this artist concept with a pilot in a cockpit trust me there will be only a pilot in a cockpit for test flight. When they get it where they want it to be, they will put AI in it because of all the reasons I just laid out for you. No crew rest, no flight issues, no, it doesn't have to pee, it doesn't have to poop, doesn't have to eat, doesn't have to sleep, you know, doesn't care if it gets home again or not, you know, all those things. It's, it's scary stuff, but it is real. This is it in the refueling configuration. These are lifting bodies. The jets uh, have lifting bodies as well, but they still have control surfaces because of the really rapid maneuverability that they have to have. This craft is testing. There are videos of it at like 35, 40,000 feet reentering the Earth's atmosphere now. It is a ISR aircraft, an intelligence surveillance reconnaissance aircraft, but it also comes in weaponized versions and other versions. If you saw that in the sky and looked up and saw that, you know, what would you call it? You wouldn't recognize it as anything that you've seen before. Here again, and here is another one that's out there, the TR-3A Black Manta. And this is the one that's been flying in and out of Area 51. And it's showing it here in manned, you know, test flight configurations. Outside the hangar where this is, there have been photographs taken of radio control towers that are used like to fly the drones. And so this will be an unmanned craft that will fly as a bomber, an unmanned bomber. Right. So it will not have those windows in the front that you see there now. That's for test pilots and crews to work the kinks out on this thing. Look at it. No visible control surfaces. The thermal print from this is not observable to the naked eye. And it is designed so that even thermal imagery struggles to figure out what it is. I hope they don't put nukes on this thing. Oh, you know they will. You know they will. They can't help themselves. And so will the Chinese and so will the, you know, the Russians. That's so, even scarier. Yeah, yeah, very, very much so scary. So, I mean, I hope everybody enjoyed this segment because I wanted to show you where we were with drives or where we think we are, or what we don't know, or that we let's all agree we don't we don't know crap about where they are with the drives. 
But I wanted you to see that the drives are not just something of science fiction. People that are scientists with research money are actually, you know, studying these things, trying to put them into and build prototypes for them. And the M drive is one I know that there's been a prototype for, but I also told you that the gray version of it has been poo-pooed and shut down. And I told you that I didn't believe the research that came out of the university because it was unsolicited and it's seemingly purposely negative. But yeah, I think we are in a very interesting place with all this. You have any questions? Orbs. Yeah. Aside from the, the lens issue, like lens flare, <laughs> frame rate, things like that. Is there any reason to believe the <clears throat> Air Force has been working on or Space Force has been working on anything that are related to these autonomous orbs? Yeah. So just check this out. Can an orb fly? Okay. So what I did was I looked you around. Got, you got the you got it right there though. <laughs> in the back one, in the in the one in the back. What I did was I looked around uh, a lot to try to find about propulsion systems, dynamics, you know, uh, flight surface controls in an orb or a tic tac or something like that. You know, right away here pops out this Japan Ministry of Defense, and some guys created. You know, they have created in Japan's Ministry of Defense, they've created this orb that can fly around. Now, I know a lot of people look at that and go, well, it's nothing more than just a drone enclosed in, you know, into a circular sphere. And I thought, okay, so are there coatings for that, which would make it look like a sphere that could intake and exhale, right, sufficient thrust to cause it to still fly. And as it turns out, there are a number of different coatings that could go around that, which would make it look silver or make it look white. And it can be in that ball and it can intake the air and thrust down and it just pushes out. It, it takes more motor speed and power to be able to do that, but it can do that. There are also designs that utilize air channels. So where that thing is turning inside the orb, it might have in one design, I saw four exhaust ports. So it has four exhaust ports and it has an intake at the top. So it sucks down in, it compresses it as a fan and then throws it out the four exhaust ports. And then what happens is by manipulating the orifice of the exhaust ports, you're now steering the orb making it go forward or up or down or backwards or left or right. And it's all being computer controlled to have it do that. So yeah, it can do that. There are even now toys that you can buy for a few dollars on Amazon that are orbs, little plastic orbs. And they have this, it's the same concept, only they're lit up and it's got a fan inside and you can throw it and it goes out, stops and comes right back to you. And some of them, they'll fly and follow. Some of them, they'll fly and hover. So yeah, orbs can fly. And yeah, is this kind of the exotic propulsion device that we're talking about? No, it's not. But it means that an orb can fly. And the engineering for it, it turns out, is really simplistic. So mm -hmm. if you were going to create an ISR drone that you didn't want to be seen because it's a big curved surface, which means that it's really hard for radar to grab it, right? Because it has no flat surfaces to bounce off of. It is a distinct possibility that countries are building these things. It's all just about the weight. You know, what does the camera weigh and what kind of resolution can you get out of it? Or what are you trying to do with it? And you know, how long will the battery work and all that kind of stuff. And they're really good with those things now. That's, that explains the Mosul orb. Have you seen that video? <clears throat> I have. Yeah. It's, it's caught by, it's a, not, by a predator or a reaper rather. Yeah. But it's not turning on a dime. It's <clears throat> just traveling forward. Like one of those orbs that you just showed. And it's just as a reflective surface, but yeah. the alacrity with which 
arrow latched on to that thing indicates to me that it's one of ours it was caught on camera and they just want to they're using the whole et hypothesis mm -hmm. to discount it right because arrow everything that comes out of that office has been a disinformation op or a honeypot yeah right you know people who speak to them have to sign a non-disclosure <laughs> agreement you know that I I have no doubt. I have no doubt. No doubt why? whatsoever. Why? Exactly. Why? Right? Because because they got your ass. That's why. Yeah. So. And they are probably one of the. They probably would attempt to, you know, twist your arm around your back and and make you pay for it. A lot of companies make you sign them and don't really have any intention of doing it. They think that the mere signature is enough to scare you, but not all. Well, not, I mean, if, if you're just you reporting know. a story to Congress and they make you not sign a non-disclosure, like <laughs> go pound sand. No. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Why? Right. What do I like? What do I get? And a lot of people don't, don't think through the consequences of that. <clears throat> it's like, no. why are you asking yeah. me to sign something that is in the public domain? Yeah right so yeah, it's, it's exactly. clearly a counterintelligence honeypot whatever operation and again yeah you, you, i mean you just debunked the most soul orb brother you just debunked it <laughs> it's not it's like our stuff it's our stuff it's clearly our stuff so yeah well, oh, oh, yeah, look look I, look I could be persuaded in another direction but i i yeah. think if you're accepting Occam's razor, right? The simplest explanation tends to be the correct explanation. I think mm -hmm. we have some fancy orb with lots of optics in it that flies similar to that Japanese thing. And <clears throat> yeah, because if you look at the video again, it's not making any crazy <clears throat> movements. It's not traveling at hypersonic speeds. It's just kind of just rolling along. Yeah. And the fact that arrow is so insistent on like that's this is one of the, our big anomalies no it's not yeah good i'm glad to hear you say that because the more i've looked into this the more convinced i am that so much of what we're seeing is really part of you know tools and weapons and technology has been developed in support of the space wars but i'm also i again and i'm always going to go back to that with caveat i also am certain that there are things that are out there and around us that defy our understanding of physics at this particular point and i think it's based on what i've seen as a remote viewer that there is i know that there's other you know civilizations and that there's other technology and other life that's out there I, that i do not doubt but the frenzy that we currently find ourselves in i'm really hoping that you know these episodes give people at least some pause and some discernment to try to kind of step back and go well you know yeah probably so <laughs> you know that, that's probably what it is i mean look at where we've gone and, and understanding the space war versus the space race understanding gray versus black as in terms of a project, understanding that disinformation goes hand in glove with intelligence and the protecting of intelligence and, and understanding that the Supreme Court nor any other lower court has any ability or right to turn around and say the intelligence services are special access programs or the contractors that work for them. That you will expose all of this to the american people it doesn't matter what congressman or senator you know calls them before them on the mat and says i demand you give that to us they are protected actually by every supreme court decision that says it is not the job of this court to step into and make a ruling on the state and the national security that's not our job and we won't do it so that gives us a, a really good rod of truth not saying that there are not strange things out there that we can't explain i like that thought right i i do i dig it that there's yeah. stuff out there that you look at and just go like i've never seen that before but there's other stuff that's out there that you can look at it and go like oh yeah i've seen that yeah and that. you have to be if you're following <laughs> 
this topic, you have to be discerning because the more popular you get, the more of a mouthpiece you become, the more likely you're going to become a target for this nonsense. Yeah. Right. Where you're going to have a disinformation agent like a Richard Doty say, Hey, I got this amazing footage I want to share with you. And it turns out it's the fucking Moselle, Mosul Urb. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, that said, I do believe that Grush's statements are true. Like he interviewed 40 people. I don't think any disinformation campaign is that elaborate <clears throat> that you can get 40 people to agree to the same thing. Maybe you can. I don't know. But that's a lot of secrecy to maintain, right? Yeah, it is. I'm not saying it hasn't happened before because I'm pretty sure it has. But yeah, <laughs> right. it's. You know, I.e. Yeah, I.e. the Manhattan, the Manhattan, well, the Manhattan Project, <laughs> maybe, maybe that one it might be one example. TWA Flight 800. I mean, a lot of it, it the, you know, it all depends. It, people have a tendency to kind of believe what somebody in authority tells them, mm -hmm. or unfortunately, they have an inability to believe what somebody in authority tells them and will believe anything that anybody not in a position of authority tells them. So that, that, that's where I think we are in this country right now. I think in the 40s, we're in the other direction. I think yeah. now that we've been lied to so much so frequently and so often and politicians are so incompetent that oh yeah the the default position of most people is they're lying to us and you know it could be we have this virus coming and it has a 98 percent lethality rate ah that's bs you know that's not real <laughs> and then people get wiped out and with the coronavirus as an example i mean they lied to us in the very beginning right Oh, it, it came from a bat that bit a penguin that was eaten at a wet market. Well, wait, there's there's like a, happened, the only level to step in some pig poo, which then was carried over and mixed with some. Eel yeah, poo and you say, and hey, wait, like right down the, you know, right across the river, there's a level, the only level four containment facility in all of China, and they focus on novel coronavirus research. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it leaked from the lab. <laughs> racist, racist, <laughs> what? <laughs> right and you know when you get a claim like that that you're onto something and then it turns out that this you know eco health pitches this to darpa and darpa's like oh hell no this is this looks a lot like gain of function and then fauci's like how much you want <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> i mean anyway yeah, that's exactly how it went down look everybody I'm older than most people probably watching this. So I have learned that survival in this life at a quality level means keep a freaking sense of humor. Yeah. You know, stop looking for reasons to be offended. Yeah. Right. Don't get up every day pissed off waiting and looking for something to piss you off even more because I guarantee you're going to find it these days more so maybe than ever. It's going to be there, but you know, not really. I mean, I, you start looking at, you know, shit that went down back in the sixties, seventies of weather underground and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Right. I still remember that stuff. Cause I was a kid growing up those days and it's like, you know, every time you think it, it it's like the worst it's ever been. All you have to do is look backwards, you know, 30, yeah. 40 years and you'll, and you're kind of like, Actually, it, it's been pretty bad before, too. Yeah, imagine if you were in Ukraine in the 1930s, <laughs> oh, right? God, yeah. Yeah, no food yeah. for you. Yeah. And people are funny. And I was reading the other day, I know that, you know, when, because my father fought in World War II in, in Europe. And I know that, you know, the United States government spent a great deal of money, you know, helping to rebuild Germany, et cetera, and even Japan along with other allied contributions. And I know that German citizens post-war were just brutalized and butchered by the Russians and by it, just people, Czechoslovakians, Poles. I mean, anybody, if they get their hands on a German, it was not going to be a good day for that German. And I have heard interviews of, of the German people. I'm not sure how this relates to it, but it's like, 
There was no, they had the cognitive dissonance in their head, the Germans. Like, you're doing, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're beating up and mistreating children. How could you possibly do that? And I'm thinking to myself, do you not understand why people are like that? I mean, I think you'd get a lot more purchase if you just turned around and went like, you know what? Turnabout's fair play. You're right. We were bad. We did bad things. We ignored it. You know, we didn't do anything to stop it. And Russians were worse. Please Ru- forgive Russians, us. The <laughs> Russians were objectively worse, though. Oh yeah. I think I think the average woman that walked out. Let me see if I let me see if I have this book here. Yeah, of course I do. I have this gigantic pile, and it's like at the very bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Russian right. atrocities during the war. Post my history professor at Stanford. Let's see if I can do this. Oh, this is going to be amazing if I can get away with it. Nope, I did not quite entirely get away with it. All right, everybody, she gets hit in the head with a book, passes out, I'll finish the show. Well, at least the the books didn't. Uh, <laughs> you see, how, like it's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So the Russians in Germany. So I, I want to say it's at the beginning. The stats. But, but, but yeah, he's got the stats. And again, you know, like these are obviously best it's probably like the Japanese and Nanking, and the Japanese and Manchuria. Well, you yeah. should read about what they did in Port Arthur in like 1900, <clears throat> 19, well, I think it was like the when they fought the Chinese in like the eight, late 1890s. And then. I think like like somebody killed a Japanese soldier, so they they just went the Japanese went ballistic and like killed everybody. They're cutting off heads, like women and children. Like they didn't. We well, go. it's and what the thing that you cannot do is you cannot turn around and say you know and place all blame on the law of Bushido or the the fact that they were samurai or something like that because. In Japan during that time, in Manchuria, particularly in Nanking, you know, the two major newspapers in Japan were publishing every week the tallies of two Japanese non-commissioned officers who had a race ongoing for how many heads they could lop off of the Chinese. So people were placing bets and cheering for their particular sergeant, you know, because this week he got 15 Chinese heads and the other guy only got 12 kind of thing, you know, we're in two different locations. I mean, that's a national support of that kind of brutality. So that's not the United States and that's not us. And we're not doing that. And you've never seen us do that. And uh, look, look, we 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 do have, we do have, (laughs) we do have aberrations, right? For instance, when we fought the Island hopping, campaign in world war ii the morrow yeah like, oh the island of pacific yeah the, the, yeah there was no there was no mercy on either side no right and it was um, that kind of war and yeah i mean that like was probably savage. that's probably the united states at its worst but it's not like the you know they were it was one-sided no right? but I, sorry to take us down that rabbit hole i just wanted to say that i don't want people to feel like they've been shortchanged or that, you know, the the nation doesn't have your best interests in mind or that shucks. I thought we were really going to find out about all the alien life form on the planet and, you know, who we were talking to and who we're sharing DNA with, et cetera. Well, don't get me wrong. I I think, I think we do. (laughs) There are definitely special access programs that have recovered non-human craft of sorts either through no archaeological doubt. digs or yeah i have no doubt um and I, I have no doubt about that whatsoever and it's just it's for whatever reason it's never going to be something that's you know makes the newspapers or gets you know released in congress or some report it's just not and why because it's too important it's too important I, I, at the it, very least just just tell us we're not alone <laughs> Right, because that could change the whole trajectory of the species if we know that we need to be working for finding a second home. Because look, I mean, there, there's a there's a ton of dopey people out there who think, oh, they're all like they would have destroyed us by now if they could. 
They, I mean, like, what if we're cattle? Right? You wouldn't destroy your own <clears throat> cattle. Right? Again, I'm not saying that's what it is, but there's a dozen different reasons that I could just pull out of my fourth point of contact, right? And say, you know, what this, I think you're probably the only one who understands what. I, what yeah, I know. I was what, what actually going to enlighten everybody and tell them what that No, means. you should. You should. You should. You should. <laughs> you should. Point of contact, it's a, it's what a paratrooper uses. You have these four, you know, five points of contact. And so the fourth point of contact is your ass. <laughs> so it's the balls, your feet, it's your calf, it's your thigh, it is your buttocks, and, and then it is your push up muscle, as they call it. So your lats. And that's how you do a parachute landing fall. And every paratrooper is taught that. And so somewhere, somehow, somebody, a paratrooper adopted that language that said, get your head out of your fourth point of contact, which meant get your head out of your ass. And so it's stuck and paratroopers all know what it means because I'm sure some general somewhere said that to me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I get your head out of your fourth. Yeah, point like, of what are you talking about? More house, you know, but the, I yeah. mean the, but the bottom line is, I could come up with a dozen different explanations on the spot as to why we haven't been destroyed. Right. So I'm not saying that everything out in the universe is dark and dreary, but there are probably, you know, some species that would be aligned with our interests. Some that would be misaligned or, you know, oppose our interest. You know, they might think we're a, a plague. And then there might be species that are so advanced and beyond our comprehension that they're indifferent. You know, we could be like an anthill. I think all of the above are true. And they would have to be true just to have good order and balance within the universe. You know, there's nothing, there's not dark without light or vice versa. There's not good without evil. There's However you choose to define that, it, it, if there are malevolent societies that are interstellar travels, then there are benevolent and everything in between. And so, yeah, some might want to harvest us, <laughs> you know, for yeah. snacks to get to the next place. Some might want to teach us, uh, we, I, you know, and some might, as you just said, indifferent to us. Because it would be like, you know, do you want to teach mealyworms? Right? No. Yeah. So no. I have other things to do. I'm not going to teach these human mealyworms. I'm not going to do that. So I don't know. But here, what I know is what I'm in charge of. And that's me right now. And I'm certainly not in charge of that. And life is short enough to run around and spend all of these non-recoverable minutes or hours or days weeks months years pursuing these things that i i appreciate the idea that it would really be good to know the truth about it i understand why maybe the truth is not being shared and beyond that would i like it to would somebody to say that yeah i would but am i going to go protest that i'm not because I'm not in charge of that on you know yeah. <laughs> on this planet. I'm not in charge of it. I'm in you know, I'm in charge of you know teaching and writing and doing what I do and you know trying to stay healthy to live long and and you know do those kinds of things to love and laugh and and create that that's what we're in charge of. That should be our ultimate goal. I my heart really goes out to a lot of the people that are involved in this stuff that just absolutely it, it is their only identity. They define themselves by yeah. this fight. And I just and the other, wish the other I had issue, a way to make The them, other issue, too, is uh, it's become doctrinal for some people, right? <clears throat> yeah. It's nuts and bolts. It's nothing else. It can't, and you have to be flexible in understanding this topic because, I mean, for all we know, it could be some form of ultra terrestrial. Maybe there's a presence on earth that you know we have a very narrow range of senses and our you know we filter a lot of stuff out maybe we're not fil and we're likely actually very likely filtering out a greater reality that we just don't see there's an unseen world that we don't see 
And part of what people report as a phenomenon might be that, right? Yeah. And again, I'm speculating, but it could be maybe, maybe it's a manifestation from Gaia. Maybe Gaia's conscious, right? Maybe the plot. I don't know. I'm not saying that's yeah, the no, case. But I get it. Yeah. We ha each of us, I guess, has to look at and decide what we're going to spend our life doing. And mm -hmm. I, for one, am not going to spend my life being some sort of nouveau Don Quixote charging freaking windmills that I know. You know, right. uh, I've been around long enough and been on the back end of that stuff in the intel community and stuff. Don't waste your life doing that. Don't so waste one, another hour <laughs> doing one that. One quick question about that. <laughs> so yeah. why are they so reluctant to just admit <clears throat> that we're not alone? Like just that. And if because they ask questions, it would no further it, questions. It, it would not. It wouldn't stop there. That if they said that, it wouldn't stop there, and they know that it's human dynamics, right? It's human nature. If they turn around and give the public one scintilla of movement in that direction, and say, "Okay, well, damn it, fine, all right, yeah," you know, it won't stop there then it'll be lawsuits and it'll be you know trying to get congressmen which as you said you know they're just foolish vote seekers that are you know grandstanding on this thing sitting up there because why because they think it's getting them you know 15 minutes of airtime they wouldn't otherwise get they don't have to pay for it you know and that's what they're doing they're not there because they're gonna I I mean, I my personal view is they better go there because I don't think we're going to make it post 2024. Oh. I think that election is the end because no one trusts government at all, at all. So, <clears throat> well, we've been there before, too. So I get that. And you know what? If it doesn't change dramatically and it stays where it is, the great beauty of the system of government that we have is it's not, you know, we don't get like Putin deciding he's going to king him. So he's going to be the new czar of Russia. We don't get, you know, the president of China. We don't like uh, North Korean, you know, the leadership of North Korea, that that guy's going to be there regardless of what un, until he dies. And is, the, is that because it's, is, it, is that just because they're more naked about it? <clears throat> no, because they're tyrants. <laughs> And they have a tyrant's playbook that they follow. And the tyrant's playbook that they follow is designed to keep the masses dumb and stupid and focused in looking at the wrong thing. It's a constant shell game. And, you know, everything that ever happened in the Soviet Union, everything that ever happened in communist China, everything that ever happened in North Korea, it's all been the same thing. I mean, it's all lies, smoke and mirrors and you know, carrying on. I mean, Stalin was a sheer buffoon according to Lenin. Lenin had no use for Stalin whatsoever. He sent Stalin on one operation, one tactical operation. And Stalin did what any infantryman would just be drummed out of the Corps for. He lined up for an ambush and had wet, it, they shot at each other through cars. That was the great leader, Stalin. You know, that was his tactical prowess. The thing that allowed Stalin to rise to power was the fact that Stalin, Lenin trying to find a job for him because he was devoted, right? And it, even if you're devoted, it's like, okay, I'll, I'll let you take the trash out. No, what he did was he made him his secretary, like, handle my appointments. But because he's a tyrant in the making, what he did was he used his ability to schedule appointments for Lenin to set other people that were in the party at the hierarchy of the party, the height of the leadership. And he would say, go in to, to Lenin and say, you know, comrade Berinsky will be here today at two. And then Lenin would, where's Berinsky? And Stalin would come in and go, I, I don't know. I, I, he, I told him to be here at two o'clock. Oh my, I'll, I'll find, I'll get to the bottom of this and then come back in again and go, well, he just said he can't come today, <laughs> you know, and he set them up like that to where they fell out of favor with Lenin 
because Lenin started to feel like, why? Because when you're a tyrant, you don't trust people. And Stalin made sure that Lenin didn't trust the people that Stalin didn't want him to trust. And when Lenin died, Stalin just stepped, he just stepped in. I mean, people were looking around like, what? And he just took over. I mean, he just yeah. took over and, and you know, that, became that's, a Paul that's how it and, happens yeah. in 99% yeah. of human interaction. Someone <laughs> and then just steps proceeded in. to just systematically murder yeah. his countrymen. Because people don't speak entire... up. People no, don't speak up. Right. Well, not they in just those keep places. their mouth shut. Yeah. Not that's... here either. Not here either. <laughs> I mean, well, we live through COVID. You're, you're correct. I mean, we don't until it reaches a certain point, and then I think yeah. we do. But he just took over for life, you know. And anybody that opposed, you know, got a bullet in the back of the head. People, you know, starve. So what? They starve. And then people in Europe, and particularly people in the UK and the United States, while those people are starving. You know, come up with cute little sayings like, well, you know, yeah, you got to break some eggs to make an omelet. Oh, is that what's going on in the Ukraine? Well, millions of them were eating each other and starving to death because Stalin took all the grain and took it to Moscow and other places up north. That's what you're doing. I see Brit, you're breaking some eggs to make an omelet, a communist omelet. But you see, kids don't get taught that in school now. And, and kids don't read those kinds of things, which is why, you know, there's this run they were running around wearing che Guevara shirts and you know che hats and they're all about all that they of course they have no idea the guy was actually a murderous thug you know <laughs> they have no idea what he really did but oh you know it's just crazy and one quick anecdote so there was this young adult who was challenging one of the republican presidential candidates about his kind of anti-Ukraine policy. <clears throat> and it's just like, well, why don't you support Ukraine? And, and I think it was Ramaswamy. So Ramaswamy gave some, you know, reasonable answer, whatever. And my buddy, who's a, he's the, he was infantry, but now he's like, whatever, they move into strategy or whatever. But he's a colonel now, a full mm -hmm. bird. And he said, if I were a political candidate, I would bring along with me an army recruiter. So in one of these little, <laughs> like little snide like why don't you support ukraine well you know here's the reasons but if you do i have an army recruiter right here you can sign up hey they're anyway. taking volunteers you can just like buy a ticket go over there and, you know land in turkey and start moving to the east and they'll get you there eventually but yeah you won't do that because it's just you know you've been fed by some you know socialist leftist professor who is you know, filling your head full of woke ideologies and activism. And you really don't know the history of the world or the history of the states or the history of anything. You really don't. And if you think you do, spend 10 minutes with me. <laughs> you know, spend 10 <laughs> minutes with me and I'll prove that you don't. It's just nuts. But it's not my job to educate them. It's yep. not. Don't but, figure hey, it out. And platforms like this or in other platforms, here's what is starting to happen. People like you, Sean, and or me and others are stepping up and going, my job is to purvey truth. And my job is not to fear cancellations or the other kind of thing. My job is to assemble people and give people a platform to tell the truth. Now, if they're full of shit, I won't have them on. But if they're strong and telling the truth about what they're doing, great. That's a message that needs to be out there. And more and more and more, it needs to be there. And I think that that is a tide rising, not a, a tide that is stagnating or falling. I think people have reached their saturation point. And yeah, could it get worse before it gets better? Absolutely. It will. It will yeah, but absolutely. But we are a dynamic, proud, intelligent people. And a lot of us have this kind of live and let live perspective on things until it truly gets to the point where people just go, you know, damn it, you know, and throw something down and go, that's not going to happen anymore. And it's starting to happen already. Unfortunately, that has a tendency to happen in very radical ways 
through some factions and with some people, you know, resorting to violence kind of thing. Like, like I mentioned earlier, like the underground. Which weather. we don't condone, which we don't no, condone. We do not right. condone at all because it is so unnecessary. We have a power of a vote. We don't have a czar. You know, we don't have a czar and we don't have a benevolent leader who we think doesn't even take a crap like they do in North Korea or other places. We have leaders that are maybe voted into a position and when they do not muster up and measure up, then typically we show them the door. I realize there's a lot of things in our election process that might question that at this particular point in time. Uh, yeah, let's but not that's go another there. story. Yeah. <laughs> even though I even though I almost went there and you stopped me. Now I'm stopping you. All right, brother. I gotta go, but right, I appreciate your time as always. You're the best. Of course. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sean. Bye, you guys. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, a Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.